Thank you very much. It's a real honor for me to uh, give this lecture today and also to take part in this magnificent week uh, celebrating the scientific life of Yves Meyer. And so for this reason, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to these ABEL events. And so in this lecture, I will talk about wavelets, of course, and at some points, wavelets will fade away. And then we'll talk about sparsity and what we can do with it. Okay, so at the beginning, we have waves, and then we have waves at very many different frequencies. And at the beginning, we also have signals. And so here's a one-dimensional signal, and as you can see, it has some discontinuities. In this case, it has two of them, one here and one here. And then we have all kinds of signals. They can be 1D, they can be 2Ds. Uh, we can see that we have transient phenomena, edges, uh, and so we have lots of different signals. And what was realized, as Eve said, about 200 years ago, which to me is a magical thing, actually, that we can, uh, all of these signals, in fact, any signal with finite energy or finite squared variation can be represented as a superposition of these waves and that's the principle of Fourier analysis, a harmonic analysis. And the way you expand a signal as a superposition of plane wave, which is very surprising at first because we can see that waves are gentle. We can see that signals may not be gentle, they have discontinuities, and yet I can create the uh, discontinuities by adding up waves. And the way we represent this is by essentially Computing, as Stefan explained in his lecture, correlation coefficients between the signal of interest and a plane wave. That's a coefficient. And then I just put this coefficient in front of, of, the, um, of the wave in, in question, and I just expand, just like in an orthonormal basis, and the reason is that plane waves are orthonormal basis. Okay, and so that's a principle of harmonic analysis. We have these heroic cancellations. And so it's kind of worth going through the main steps of harmonic analysis. In harmonic analysis, we have a first step, which is a process of analysis, where we compute these coefficients. And then, oops, I, I'm going to get confused. OK, we compute these coefficients. And then we have the synthesis, where we take the coefficients and we assemble them together to create a, a signal. And then there is this fundamental principle of the Parseval relationship that says that the variations of the signals, the squared variation of the signal, or the energy of the signal is conserved. And so the, re, the harmonic analysis is really these three steps. And I understand this best through the cover of The Dark Side of the Moon by the Pink Floyd, where we have really a harmonic analysis in action, where we have a, a wave coming, and then the prism would split his wave and re reveal the different colors. So analysis is really going this way, and then synthesis is going the other way, where I can put the colors and reassemble them to create the incoming signal. And as you can see from these pictures, there is no loss of energy. And so it is this harmonic analysis. OK, so we're all familiar with this. And so I said I would speak a little bit about wavelets. But first, one thing that was perhaps not said is that, of course, Fourier analysis has a dual version. So the, the fact that I can represent signals as superposition of plane waves has a, a dual version to it. And that's Shannon's sampling theorem that says that essentially any band-limited signal can be sampled without any information loss from, um, from uh, <coughs> at regular intervals. And so if I just were to know the values of the signal at, on a, an equispace grid, then I would know the signal everywhere. And of course, this principle is a backbone of digital signal processing. We would not have digital signal processing without, without this theorem. Okay? That's the same as saying that the trigonometric system is complete, but it's a different interpretation of it that underlies much of what we do digitally these days, because it says that we can sample without information loss. OK. And then we had wavelets. And so wavelets, as you've seen many times, and perhaps I'll go fast, in these lectures are dilates and translates of a single waveform, right? So there's a notion of scale. So we have wavelets at very fine scale. We have wavelets at coarser scale, capturing different frequency contents 
of the signal, and we also have this notion of locations, where I'm going to zoom, as, he, uh, as Stefan and uh, Ingrid said so beautifully, at precise location on the signal to extract information. These wavelets are dilates and translate of a single waveform, and they also form an orso basis. And so wavelet analysis repeats the steps of harmonic analysis, where we have these three fundamental things. I can decompose a signal by calculating correlation coefficients between my signals and wavelets. If you give me a, a table of coefficients, I can synthesize the signal, just as usual, and then I have the same energy conservation of energy, which is that the energy of the signal is e exactly equal to the energy of the coefficients. But what's interesting about wavelet is, as you've seen in many of the talks, it's a different prism. It's not the Newton prism I showed you before. It organizes information in a different way, where bits of information come to you organized by scale. So here we have score scales and locations. OK. And what we see in this picture is that we have our, our original signal on the left. Here we have its frequency spectrum over there. And so our information is organized by frequency. And here we have the wavelet coefficient tables. And one thing that both Ingrid and Stefan mentioned already is one thing is striking. Two things are striking. One is that we see a lot of, so these red bars represent the amplitude of coefficient. And they're very small. In fact, they're equal to zero. So we see a lot of coefficient that vanish. And then we see locations on the signal where the coefficients are not zero. They are either positive or negative. And if you trace this over here, it corresponds exactly to the locations of the singularities. Okay, so it's the same amount of information, but it's organized in a different way. Okay, and once we can take this coefficient, this information, and we can plot it, and so what I'm plotting here is on the log scale, I'm going to look at, I'm going to sort the coefficients by decreasing order of magnitude, and I'm just going to plot this. And so what we see is the Yellow line is the Fourier spectrum, and so we see that the Fourier coefficients decay, indicating that most of the energy is at low frequencies. But what we can see also on this plot is that the wavelet coefficient decay much faster. There is enhanced sparsity. And this sparsity, this enhanced sparsity, has tremendous consequences. Okay, and so why do we have this sparse representation? So this is my take on perhaps what has been said already, is that wavelets are orthonormal to polynomial of low degrees. And so when I have my little wavelets uh, going across, it's calculating a dot product with what it sees, but what it sees is a polynomial, and so it returns zero. And the only time it doesn't return zero is when it crosses uh, a singularity like here. So you're going to see a burst in information. And as Stefan said, this information is actually sampled. I don't need to track it continuously. It's sampled at a rate which is depending on the scale you're at. And so most of the time, it returns extremely small coefficient or even zero coefficient if it sees a piecewise portion of the signal. And when it sees a discontinuity, a transience, it, re it reports an event, some coefficients. And so that's why the coefficient table is so sparse, because when it's actually looking at a smooth piece, it returns a very small coefficient. OK. And that is one way of saying this in plain English, is that wavelets only feel singularities. And this phenomenon is true in, in any dimension. OK. And so because I have this increased sparsity, then I can, as I said, I can try to, sorry, I'm going to get confused a lot. I can try to plot the coefficients by decreasing order of magnitude. And I see that the, the wavelet coefficient sequence falls off mark more quickly than the Fourier coefficient sequence, meaning that there's an energy compaction, that most of the variation of the signal is compacted in just a few coefficients. OK. All right, and the consequence of this is I can actually re approximate signals with just a few terms. And so here is an example where I'm going to do, I'm going to look at my expansion. And so, but in this expansion, I'm just going to keep only a few terms. And I think in this example, I'm keeping 50 terms. And I'm not keeping the first 50 terms in the series. I'm keeping the 50 terms that are largest in magnitude. So I look at all the table, and I'm keeping the largest term. And I do this both for the Fourier expansion and the wavelet expansion. 
And so in yellow, we have the reconstruction, and we see the Gibbs phenomenon that I'm sure most of you are familiar with. And in red, I see the wavelet reconstruction, which is far more accurate than the yellow reconstruction. I can still see, of course, it's not perfect. I can still see a little bit of Gibbs phenomenon, but it's far more localized. And if I were to quantify how well I'm doing, well, I can see that you have, on, a, on a, again, a log scale, the relative L2 error as a function of the number of coefficients I keep in the expansion. And you can see that I can get higher and higher, more and more accurate approximations with wavelets compared to Fourier. And so the gain can be dramatic. So for example, essentially, with the same number of coefficients, wavelets give me one more digit of accuracy in the expansion. OK. Now, this enhanced sparsity has many consequences. I'd like to talk about three of them. One, which I think both Ingrid and, and Stefan talked about, which is signal approximation and data compression. Another that we did not discuss is statistical estimation. I'd like to explain this. And the third is a new way of trying to do data acquisition, which goes by the name of compressed sensing that I hope uh, I have a chance to get into. OK. So let's talk about data compression first. So this is uh, an image on the left. On the right, you see it's spectrum. And so for you to see something, you have to cheat a bit. Um, so I have to kind of rescale. I, I apply a contrast function to show you the Fourier coefficients. Or, or otherwise, you'd see only something which is black. And so we see the spectrum. Sorry. Oops. We see the spectrum. This is a spectrum of this. OK. And so as we've seen in, in, in the previous two talks, I have now the wavelet transform. It's a different prism. It's a different way of computing information. And I have the wavelet prism now. And as uh, Ingrid and, and uh, Stefan have sh shown you so beautifully, what we see on this picture is that, well, you recognize uh, the band that Stefan and Ingrid were telling you about. And what we recognize on this picture is that essentially, so here I'm, I'm just not using the same convention as Ingrid. I'm just plotting the absolute value of the coefficients. So black means that you're 0, and white means that you're positive. I'm just plotting the absolute values. And so almost everything is black, except at the locations where there's rapid transients in the image, and in which case we see bright pixels, which mean wavelet coefficients that have a relatively large magnitude. Okay, thus encoding information. And so this is a picture of the way the wavelet pyramid is organized. And so we have exactly the same convention as both in Ingrid's and, and Stefan's talk, where you know, we go from, um, from coarse scale to finer scales. And these are the guys who are horizontals. These are the guys who are vertical. And these are the guys who detect 45-degree uh, uh, angles. OK. All right. And so when I compare, again, sparsity on real images, comparing the wavelet and the Fourier transform, I can again see this kind of improvement where I can see that the, when I re reorder the coefficients by uh, decreasing order of magnitude, and here I'm really on the log scale again, then I can see that I'm decaying much faster than the corresponding Fourier expansions. And just as for 1D signals, this has uh, consequences for uh, data compression, because immediately what we can see is that since so many coefficients are zero or close to zero, maybe I could just discard them. And so here is my original picture, and I'm going to create artificially an approximate image where I'm going to just look at the wavelet coefficient table, and I'm going to discard 97.5% of the coefficients, the smallest one. I'm going to keep the largest, the 2.5%, so this is about discarding roughly, um, it, it would be like a sort of a compression of 40x if this could think about this as a compression, which it is not, obviously. But I'm essentially discarding 97.5% uh, of the coefficients, not at random, just the smallest one. And I see the recovery over here, and it's almost the same as this one. And I can look at how well I'm doing and how well I'm doing. So I can plot the relative error, that is, the distance, as a function of the number of coefficients I'm trying to keep in my expansion versus the truth over the truth, so the just the relative errors. And I can see that I have a curve that falls off quite quickly, and it, which is much better than the curve I have for, for Fourier expansions. So sparsity leads to better approximations. 
Okay, and so this is the same curve, but plotted on the, on the log scale. And from now on, I'm going to use a log scale, which is better suited for the kind of uh, numerical comparison that I wish to, to provide. Okay, this is, again, this is an image that we're going to see later on. This is an analytic phantom that people like to use in uh, biomedical image processing, especially in MR research. And again, I can see that the wavelet coefficients, you know, have very good approximation by only keeping a few, um, a few terms. Okay, and so if I were to zoom, and I hope you can see this, but this is a four-year approximation using a, only a, a roughly 2.5% of the coefficients. I'm zooming at a part of the phantom, and you can see that it's a bit blurry, and you can see these sort of waves undulating. I hope you can see them on the screen. But when I look at the wavelet part using Ingrid's, Ingrid's wavelets, Adobe Sheets 4, then I can see that I have a much sharper uh, reconstruction. This is a picture of Paris, where Eve is from. <laughs> Uh, and so uh, we see the Notre Dame Cathedral, and so maybe I'll, I won't bore you with the, the comparison curves, but again, we have a very visual imp imp uh, different impression, whereas we use Fourier or wavelets. So here again, I'm using 2.4% of the Fourier coefficients and 2.4% of the wavelet coefficient, and this is the facade of Notre Dame, and we see that it seems to be at least more in focus than uh, when we use the Fourier transform, indicating uh, better uh, performance. Okay. All right, so we're not um, at, the, at the data compression stage yet. We're just messing around with coefficients. And so my third picture is going to be something like this. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to quantize the coefficients. That is, I'm going to approximate their values in such a way that after quantization, 2.5% of the coefficients are non-zero, but now the values of the coefficient that are not zero is not exactly what it used to be, but it's been rounded up. And so I get this picture, and again, I see very little difference. And so what did I do to kind of create this quantized picture? Well, I used a, a scalar quantizer, which is a very uh, simple object, which is uh, the response like this. This is a true value of the coefficient, I have a, a quantum Q, and then uh, depending on where you fall, then I'm going to assign you to a fixed value. And so now I'm going to replace the true value of the coefficients by an approximate value. And what I did in this experiment is to set this quantizer in such a way that after quantization, essentially 97.5% are in, at zero, so I don't need to code them, so to speak. And Ingrid and, uh, and uh, Stefan both talked about JPEG 2000, and this principle is what you'll see in JPEG 2000, except that in JPEG 2000 there's a, a lot more technology. And so the way a lot of low-C coders work, and that applies to MP3, that applies to JPEG, that applies to a lot of things, is essentially following this route where you have an image, you compute its wavelet transform, and so then you're going to quantize the coefficients. But once you quantize the coefficient, you do not have a code. What you need to do is you need, there's a lot of work that needs to go between the quantized coefficient table and the bit string that you're going to send me. And what is missing in when you're quantizing is you're not, you have to tell me, you have to address the coefficient. You have to tell me there are many coefficients you're not going to send and which ones are they. So there's an encoding that needs to take place, and there's a lot of engineering work that goes in here. And then this is a file that you will store, and you keep it on your computer so that you can watch your vacation pictures later on, or you transmit them, you send them to my mother the way I do. And then you send your bit files, and my mother receives the bit files, and then in her browser or in her uh, iPhoto, she has a decoding scheme that reads these bit strings, computes, the quantized coefficients invert the wavelet transform so that I can actually see the image. And so what I would like to do for three minutes is perhaps to explain to you how this goes about, how this, this quantization goes about, because again, this uses things that you've seen in both Ingrid and, and Stefan's talk. And so there are many ways to think about this. I'm going to talk to you about, about the uh, embedded uh, zero tree wavelet, EZW of Shapiro, Jerry Shapiro had this great idea about how to code 
after taking and quantizing the wavelet transform. That's a paper he published in 93. And so the key idea was exactly what you've heard in these lectures, in, in Ingrid's lecture, which is sometimes she showed you a patch of blue sky and nothing happens there. And what happens in the wavelet pyramid when nothing happens there is that we have a lot of very small coefficients. And this, we're not going to bother to transmit them. And so I'm going to show you how Shapiro thought about this. Now, this is not, EZW is not what is used in JPEG 2000. It's a different coder called uh, EBCOT. But uh, we're going to see how you can try to use the wavelet pyramid itself to come up with a very clever um, encoding scheme. So let's say that I have a 1D signal, and I have my wavelet coefficients. And as you've seen, they're organized in a tree. OK, so they're going to have something like this. So I have the, the, the coefficients over there, and so I want to transmit this information. So the first thing you do is you're going to set a threshold, and you're going to only transmit the first significant bit. So we can see that the coefficients are all below 63 in magnitude. So the first threshold would be 32, coding the, the, the first bit. And so I'm going to code coefficients exceeding the bit. So first, the first pass is going to look at all those coefficients whose magnitude exceeds 32. And on my table, I see that I have this one, this one, and this one. And so in the coding scheme of uh, Jerry Shapiro, these are saying, well, this is going to be a positive coefficient, this is going to be a negative coefficient, this is a positive coefficient, and everybody else is not coded, is not significant yet. But the key observation of this uh, gentleman was to say, but you see, because we have this persistence of insignificant zeros, instead of actually sending you a lot of zeros, what I can do is I can send you a symbol for this node, for get, saying, and when you receive this symbol, it says, I'm not, I'm not going to care to actually tell you any value going down because it's all insignificant. And so it's using the fact that we have this persistence of insignificant coefficient to actually say, let's stop the coding here, and I'm not sending you anything. What I'm going to do instead is I'm going to send you a significant bit for this one, a significant bit for this one, and a significant for this one. And I, I send you only very few bits because then you just stop the transmission. And then you say, well, so that's the first level of approximation. And when you receive this very short file, the decoder knows what you're sending it. You receive very few bits, and it's guesses, it guesses a quantized value for the coefficient, which is 56 minus 40, 56. The other, you actually did not care to transmit them, so it guesses that they are zero. And now you're going to say, now I'm going to move to the next bit, and I'm going to send you the second most significant bit. And so now you, what you do is you decrease the threshold from 32 to 16, and now some coefficients become significant. And so we can see that, um, I don't know, for example, this one was negative, but this one becomes significant. It's above 16. And then there's another one that becomes significant. This one was not before, but now it's becoming significant. And then you keep sending bits. So you're going to send me their bits, and then we're going to decrease the threshold, and so on and so forth. And when you do this very cleverly, where you keep on sending bits in an um, embedded stream like this, then after the second pass, we have a better approximation of what the real structure is. And we keep on going. And what you see, we have an embedded bit stream where we actually resolve the signal more and more. Now, this theme was not exactly what it was retained in JPEG 2000. They use a different coder called the um, EBCOT, uh, which is a bit different from EZW. But this idea of taking wavelet transform, quantizing, and then have a clever encoding scheme is what you'll find in JPEG 2000. And um, you, if you have a laptop with a browser, uh, chances are that it will use uh, JPEG 2000. It's also used, for example, to compress movies by compressing um, differences between consecutive frames in, in Hollywood. And by the way, the coder used uh, the 9.7 wavelets of Cohen, Debussy, and, and Fovo. All right. What else can we do with sparsity? Well, we can enhance statistical estimation. And the way this works is what we've been talking about is, well, we have this signal, and we can compute its wavelet transform. 
And then we do some processing, and then we get uh, coefficient theta hat. And then we invert the wavelet transform. And so here we do a lot of digital processing. And all of what we're doing, the distortion we're introducing when we reconstruct the signal is simply the distortion induced at the coefficient level because of the isometry. Now, one thing that people realize is that, well, that could be a really good way of cleaning up signals, of si separating signal from noise. And so here we have, let's say, a noisy signal. So we see our signal, but plus quite a bit of noise, so something that looks like this. And I can go through this processing step where perhaps I want to look at this noisy data, but in the wavelet domain instead. And so now, when in the wavelet domain, well, I'm, it's a linear transform, so I'm going to get, you know, if the signal is Sig the, the data is signal plus white noise, then in the wavelet domain, I have the true wavelet coefficients plus white noise. And so the wavelet coefficient table does not clean, look as clean as it used to be because it's polluted with noise. But now we remember that perhaps the true wavelet coefficient sequence is sparse. So when I see small non-zero coefficients, I think, oh, they're probably noisy, so I'm going to get get rid of them and estimate them by zero because I'm going to assume the underlying sparse structure. And so I'm going to process the data by perhaps setting to zero the small coefficients and leaving the, the, the big coefficients untouched. Okay, That's a nonlinear filter that is essentially processing. When it sees a small coefficient, it says you're probably just noise, so I'm going to set it to zero. And when you see a large coefficient, there's information, and I'm going to keep it. And then I invert the, the transform. And then when we do something like this, we see that we have a reconstructed signal, and indeed, we have removed a lot of noise while preserving the main feature. Now, this algorithm uh, is very popular in signal processing, was introduced by Donahoe and Johnstone in 94. And the way you process data in the wavelet domain is extremely simple, and hence its popularity, where you just say, if the coefficient is above a certain threshold, you leave it untouched. And if it's below a certain level, you set it to zero. Now, there are other rules you could do, but this is a popular one. So I would like to try to understand why is it that it's so much about sparsity, this thing. And so I'm going to cheat a little bit. And so in this lecture, I'm going to have one moment where I cheat, and this is it. Uh, suppose now, so after a transformation, I have noisy coefficient sequence, which has mean theta lambda and is normally distributed with variance sigma squared. And suppose I had what Donahoe calls an oracle that would reveal whether a coefficient theta lambda, which I do not know, this is what I'm cheating, is above or below the noise level. Then I would say that if it's above the noise level, I would try to estimate it. It's worth estimating, and so my guess would be the data I got. But if I know that it's smaller than the noise level, I will set it to zero. I say, you're probably zero. I'm better off saying you're zero, because otherwise I'm going to pay a variance term. And so when you implement this rule, which of course you cannot implement this rule because you do not have this, then what you have at the end of the day is you say, well, what's the mean squared error? How well am I doing? Well, so that's easy to calculate. If you're in this scenario where theta lambda is bigger than the noise level, then you estimate this. And so the mean squared error is just a variance term, sigma squared. If you're below and you do not care to estimate, you pay the squared bias, what statisticians would call the bias squares. And so you pay basically the minimum between the two. So you're basically optimizing the bias variance trade-off. And therefore, when I look at make the sum over all coefficients, the mean squared error will just be the sum of these ideal trade-offs between bias and variance. And this expression is very interesting because we can try to graph it. And um, so here we have the coefficient sequence, the thetas, and we, the theta squared, and we see that they decay. Here we have the noise level, sigma squared. And when I plug this expression, what I see, well, I pay the minimum between the bias and the variance. So essentially, the minimum between the orange curve and the black curve. And so my mean squared error visually is essentially the red area under the minimum of these two curves. That's what it is. But now let me give you a different signal, a signal that has the same energy. So the signal-to-noise ratio will be the same, but is sparser. 
And when I do this, because it's sparser, well, it decays faster. And now I look at my mean squared error, and my mean squared error is just the same, but it's just the area between underneath the orange and the, the minimum between the orange and the black curve, and it's a green area, and it's much smaller. So I have a much more accurate estimate, and I can compare the two. So there's a tremendous reduction in mean squared error, which is offered by sparsity, which is normal because there are fewer things to estimate. Now, the beautiful work of Donohue and Johnson shows that I don't need to know, know the, whether the coefficient is above or below the noise level. I can mimic the performance of what you're seeing. And so uh, they showed that you could achieve wonderful statistical results using uh, wavelet uh, shrinkage. In practice, what I want to convey is that it works well and it's a bit what Ingrid was saying. It's in everybody's toolbox. Now, I'm not sure it's a f the tool of choice, but everybody knows about this, and they use it whenever it's applicable. And so Jean-Luc Stark, who is a French astronomer uh, working at the CEA, has done ex excellent work trying to denoise uh, images and signals uh, using these techniques and others. And so this is uh, basically a denoise spectrum for, um, uh, from the spectrum of, a, of, a, of a, the light of a star. And here you see the residual, and you see essentially white noise, which means that you really captured a lot of the important features. This is our friend Albert Einstein. We added some noise, and then you apply this algorithm, and the noise goes away, and yet the features seem to, to remain. And so this algorithm is used a lot and a lot in a lot of different fields. Uh, it's in everybody's toolbox, and, uh, and people are using it a lot. Now, the state of the art since 1994, the work of Donohue and Johnstone has changed a bit, and now, um, I think this is something that, uh, perhaps I'll skip this vignette. This is something that people have touched upon. Um, we have wavelets and they're good at sparsifying certain things, but wavelets had babies. And a baby is a curvelet, and curvelets are very good at sparsifying other things. And now people are using the power of sparsity by saying, I'm going to use wavelets, I'm going to use curvelets, I'm going to use xlets, so that I can take advantage of as much sparsity as I see to get the best possible results. And so Jean-Luc and his team are doing wonderful work trying to kind of denoise and interpret images acquired by infrared images acquired by the Herschel satellite, where they show that using wavelets in connection with curvelets and so on, you can really like recover filamentary structure, which shed insight onto the formation of, pro uh, of stars, uh, the process of star formation itself. Okay. All right. So. My, my last vignette would be about compressed sensing or enhanced data acquisition. And um, I will just start with a, a little bit of a, of a bang, which is we're seeing a lot of wonderful things. So we're seeing a picture which raw data is 15 megabytes after JPEG is 150 kilobytes, thanks to um, our colleagues' work. And uh, we barely see any distortion. Data compression works. But that is disturbing. It's disturbing because it seems that data acquisition seems enormously wasteful. So there's this optical uh, scientist at Duke, David Brady, who wrote in a book, one can regard the possibility of digital compression as a failure of sensor design. If it is possible to compress measured data, one might argue that too many measurements were taken. It's like actually the success of data compression that is problematic. So. We have, uh, so this is, uh, <laughs> we acquire a lot of data, and the amount of useful information in this data is very small compared to the stuff that we can uh, uh, essentially safely discard. So why is it that every processing pipeline uh, works this way? So the conventional approach, the thing that Stefan and Ingrid have talked to you about, and I have talked to you about, is you have a signal, it's sparse, and I'm going to use the sparsity to do a data compression approximation and so on. And so I'm going to collect the signal information. I'm going to keep the salient features, not bother about the, the small coefficients, and, and work with the salient feature. And so it's basically I collect a lot of information and then I dump a lot of information. And why do I have to do this? Why is it that we don't measure the important bits? But measuring the important bits goes back again to what uh, Ingrid was saying, is like, to measure the important bits, I have to know where the edges are going to be ahead of time and so on. I don't know where they are. 
you know, that's all the whole game. But um, with uh, Justin Romberg and Terence Tower and, and David Donohoe uh, in 06, we said, well, no, we can measure the uh, important bits. We can exploit sparsity in the sensing mechanism acquisition itself. So we can actually take very few measurements about the signal, and assuming we, that it is sparse, we're going to not lose information. And that's what I'd like to explain in the last uh, 10 minutes that I have. But I don't know how to explain this other than by going through the, the, um, the way it occurred to us. And um, the way it occurred to us is because of, uh, again, perhaps what Eve was saying, this dialogue between mathematicians and, and the sciences, between we were asked a great question in magnetic resonance imaging is how can we speed up magnetic resonance imaging? So an MR machine would like to make a picture like this, but an MR scan does not measure this. An MR scan is using quantum properties of matter to actually measure something about this, and what it actually measures is the Fourier transform of this, which is again this wonderful unity of science that Eve was talking about. It's like almost miraculous that an MR scan measures the Fourier transform of an image. And we can even argue even more, we can push Eve's argument that I don't think people would have proposed MR technology if they did not know that they could actually invert this process through the Fourier transform. So an MR scan measures the Fourier transform. So the measured data is the Fourier transform. And how do people build images? Well, they invert the Fourier transform. So I get this, I invert the Fourier transform, and I have images. And they actually get very good images. And uh, this is a blood vessel, this is a knee. We have really wonderful MR technology that we use every day. The problem is that to make an, a high-resolution MR image takes a lot of time. Because to acquire one sample in Fourier space takes an incompressible amount of time. We have to weigh that. There's physics. And so when I'm scanning, it's a process that looks a bit like this. I acquire these data points, and then this one, and then this one, and it takes a long time. You know, it takes a very long time, and now we're done. And the way, the problem is that if it takes a long time, there's a lot of applications that we cannot enable. For example, it's very rarely used for child pediatrics, because you see, a child has to stay still for two minutes in a scan. Two minutes during which you cannot breathe, for example. So you have to stop the heart for two minutes, because, well, I cannot take a single breath. Otherwise, I'm going to move and the picture will be blurry. Right? And so if you don't do this, you know, this is a picture taken from the, my colleague at Stanford, Vassana Walla. You know, this is a, a patient, a, a two-year-old patient, uh, moving in the scan. And so you cannot use these images for medical diagnostic. You can't. And so we need to speed it up. <clears throat> but how am I going to speed it up? Right? So if I speed up, it means that instead of observing the Fourier transform, I'm going to, the only way I know how to speed up is to skip samples. I don't know how to, that's what I'm going to have to do. And so at the end, if I want to speed up MR so that I can perhaps stop a child's breath for not two minutes, but maybe 10 seconds instead, deprive uh, oxygen in the brain for 10 seconds, instead of having a lot of Fourier coefficient, I'm going to have only a few. Right? And you'd say, well, how do you... Um, how, do you, how can you do this? And, uh, well, because now you're going to have an underdetermined system of equations to solve. And there's this guy who says, well, that's bad news. If you, want, if you have n unknowns, then you need n equation. There's no way around it. Okay. But we, in 2004, we made a surprising experiment where this was a, 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 medical, a prototype of a medical image. We mimicked, in fact, this, we had data given to us by radiologists. This is a fully sampled Fourier transform, but they only gave us very few samples. In fact, uh, I think 98% were missing in this experiment. And then they were reconstructing their images, and so uh, the reconstruction quality was poor. But then we tried a, a naive algorithm that exploits sparsity, and, uh, and then we could get perfect recovery. Right? So there was this thing that even though we have highly undetermined system of equation, using sparsity, we could actually uh, recover the object perfectly. And what the, the algorithm does is just some, something extremely simple. It just minimizes 
as a total variation norm for people who know what that is. Okay. All right. So it seems that we can solve sparse systems of equations. And so the thing that bails you out here is the concept of sparsity. And so what we have is we have a system that we wish to invert. We, have, we know that perhaps the right-hand side has a lot of zeros, and we're going to try to use this. So for example, I know that my image may be sparse, because we've, we've told you for three lectures that wavelets provide sparse representation of images. So I know that the solution may be sparse. And so what I could try to do is I could try to find a solution that has the fewest number of non-zero coefficients that matches these equations. It turns out that this is a combinatorial optimization problem that nobody can solve. Like it's a problem that takes exponential time. It's NP-complete or NP-hard, and it's at least exponential in time in problem size. And so what you can do instead is you can try to do something which is different, where you're going to try to reconstruct the signal by optimization, where instead you're going to use something which is extremely simple. You're going to say, I have underdetermined system of equations, ax equals y. There are many solutions to this system, and I'm going to pick the one with minimum L1 norm. Right? So what the L1 norm is, is I'm going to try to find a signal so that the sum of the absolute value of the coefficients is minimized. And that's a very simple uh, reconstruction uh, procedure. And that is computational tractable. We have very good algorithms for, do this, to, for doing this that run uh, extremely fast. And, well, is that the end of the story? Not quite, because we need something about this matrix A. It's not true that I can recover sparse solution to underdetermined system. For example, if the matrix A is something like this, it has a lot of zeros and a few non-ones, then what the measurement process reveals, it reveals a lot of zeros. It shows me that, yeah, you made of a lot of zeros, but I do not know where are these bursts of information. And so sparsity is not enough. And so, what you need is you need uh, something like this, which is that your, your signal that you're trying to image is sparse in some domain. And what you need to do is you need to have uh, information about the signal, which are essentially uh, holistic, that is, uh, weighted averages of the signal. OK, so you need something more than sparsity, a form of incoherence. And once you have this, then I give you a system of equations that you wish to solve. You use your L1 solver, and what the surprise, the mathematical theorem says, is that if there is a sparse solution, and if the rows of A are not sparse and diverse, that is, they are not all the same, then this thing will, will work. And so you can show mathematically that if the number of equations is a small number of multiple of the number of non-zero coefficients, then uh, you have perfect recovery. And so I can use sparsity in the sensing of signals itself. The fact that signals are sparse means that I need fewer bits of measurement than I thought were necessary. OK, so uh, this is an early result. But since we're running out of time, I'll, I'll finish with a few pictures and, uh, and, and uh, a few words of uh, uh, gratitude. OK, so this is a mathematical theorem. And what you should know now is that um, this thing is really in production, so people are using this sparse. So this is the work of Mickey Lustig. And so what they can do now is they can actually accelerate the scan time for children. So instead of essentially uh, taking two minutes, uh, these scans will take only 16 seconds, and they will produce exquisite pictures of details of internal organs of children. And at Stanford and elsewhere now, this kind of this fact that we can solve, uh, uh, get reconstruction for sparse images using some wavelet technology, because we reconstruct the image by assuming sparsity in the wavelet domain. We can see uh, lesions, uh, even though we go much faster, we can see lesions, we can see, maybe you don't see on these images, but you see the portal vein, the hepatic vein, and so on. So we can see a lot of details. We can, researchers are able to reduce scan time and see a lot of details about images that enable uh, rapid and reliable uh, medical diagnostic. Okay, so uh, these images are used routinely now uh, to, to diagnose uh, uh, little kids. Okay, 
Now, this is work of, uh, of uh, a, a, a native of this country, Andrew Hansen, who is working at Cambridge and is showing us how sparsity increases as resolution increases. And so here you have a pumpkin that was scanned in an MR scan, and so the resolution is 2 millimeter cube, and this is a compressed sensing image that you get by running the scan five times faster. And so we see that essentially the same picture quality, but what's interesting is as the resolution increases, we see that the compressed sensing uh, pictures increase in quality. It's still going five times faster, and so this is like the, the high resolution where we have a resolution of about 0.5 millimeter cube, where we can see almost no difference between an image you would get by acquiring a complete scan and an image that you can get by going five times faster. All right, so this is uh, going back to uh, this phantom that I was showing you before. Uh, this is my phantom, so this is a, a purely synthetic experiment where I have my phantom, and here you see a, a little code word over here, which is, can you read me? And so if you do scanning conventionally and you have a fixed amount of time, you can just scan the low frequencies, which is indicated on this box, and that's what you reconstruct. So what I implanted is high frequency and you cannot see it, but when you use uh, compressed sensing technology, then you can scan at, at, at higher frequencies randomly and then reconstruct using L1, and all of a sudden it becomes extremely readable. Now, this is of little interest, perhaps, but as you, uh, again, I'm showing the work of uh, Anders Hansen and of his collaborators, as uh, this is a patient sitting in a, in a 3D scan at Cambridge University, so they're taking a CD scan, and so I'm, I'm going to show you a slice of his head, um, and so this is the slice that we see here, and so this is uh, essentially what you can get traditionally by sampling it takes five minutes to actually acquire this scan. And so it's 1.2 cube millimeters cube, so it's about 192 by 192 cube uh, data volume. Fully sampled, it takes five minutes. But then you can put the scan into a compressive mode and just in the same scan time, acquire information elsewhere and reconstruct using L1. And so maybe I'm gonna just use this picture and so this scan is actually taking exactly the same amount of time, but you can see that, of course, here it's very hard to see anything, but here you can see uh, a lot of details. And so this is something. Okay, so I'm a bit out of time. Uh, I showed you that wavelets reveal the power of sparsity, and that has a lot of consequences, and now it's hard to see in applied mass uh, paper where sparsity is not in the title uh, somewhere. But being the last lecture, I thought that... Uh, I should say a few words about Yves Meyer, whom I met as an undergraduate student in Paris in 1994. And I was very fortunate to take his course on wavelet theory. The theory then was very young. And uh, I don't know if you remember, but yesterday in his interview, uh, Yves said that it was a very bad teacher. <laughs> and that's absolutely not true. <laughs> While it is true that he went in many, very, very many uh, directions, I think by going in so many directions, uh, he communicated a great scientific vision to me. And he showed me that applied mass could be something else than the study of differential equations. Now, this came at a time where he was actually writing his book, On Let and Algorithme Concurrent, which had a profound influence on my education. And so, through his scientific vision, Eve inspired me to do research. And just like what uh, Stefan said, I think he inspired a whole generation of young researchers to do research. And I'm certainly a very good representative of this. Now, I was very fortunate to enter a field and through Eve's lectures to be introduced of the spectacular work of Ingrid, of Rafi Koifman, of then my advisor David Donahoe, and of Stefan, and of many others who gravitated around this community of co uh, computational harmonic analysis. Um, these were my first steps uh, in, uh, in mathematics and in science. And uh, this is the first community I belong to, and I will really forever treasure their example. Um, they are really role model for them, all of them, uh, their guidance and their mentorship uh, over the years. Finally, Yves uh, mentioned that he has uh, a long collaboration with Rafi Koifman that I did not talk about. 
But in my computer, for some reason, I have a picture of a young Yves Meyer in 89, at the moment where computational harmonic analysis was in, is in full swing with Rafi Koifman. And so I will leave this with, uh, with this picture of these two heroes of mine. Thank you for your attention.